Teresita Valdeweza, dating miyembro ng KOJC, unang nagtestigo laban kay Apollo Cuiboloy sa Senado ngayong Miyerkules. Isiniwalat niya ang mga umanoy pang aabusong naranasan at nasaksihan sa ilalim ng pamumuno ng KOJC. Ayon sa mga pahayag, kasama sa mga aligasyon ang pananakot at pang-aabuso ng mga miyembro ng grupo. Patuloy ang investigasyon habang itinanggi ni Cuiboloy ang mga paratang. Ating panuuri ng mga kaganapan sa nakaraang hearing. Dito lang yan sa Pilipinas Balita Now. Good morning po, Madam Chair, Honorable Senator Riza Honteveros, and to Honorable Senator Francisco Tolentino, and to all the members of this August body. I come here today to share the truth that has been silenced for three decades because of great fear, and this is also on behalf of the many victims who have suffered in silence just like I have. I believe my testimony reflects their pain, struggles, and resilience. While I understand that this is aimed to aid in legislation, I am also grateful to be given this opportunity to inform those who still believe that Apollo Kiboloy has been innocent of the crimes he is accused of because he has never been. At the age of 17, I became a member of the church led by this man, Apollo Kiboloy, in 1918. I was a freshman student. I was eager and active in the community, even spending a significant portion of my college years living at the parsonage where he resided. In 1988, I made a difficult decision of my life to dedicate this to his ministry, driven by the belief that true fulfillment and salvation lay in serving God fully. This choice meant leaving behind my family my career, and the persons, and the person I once was. Despite the resistance of family and friends, I pursued my conviction. I joined a pioneering group that struggled to meet basic needs, but my desire to serve God fueled my persistence. Over time, I gained his trust and became a respected worker within the ministry. As the ministry grew, so did our blessings. We experienced answered prayers, and expanding membership, which deepened our commitment to serving God. Apollo C. Kibuloy, whom I revered, was considered as God unwinted, and his words held absolute authority. I respected him deeply, viewing him as truly the man of God. From the moment I dedicated my life to the ministry until 1993, I experienced a profound spiritual awakenings. I felt forgiven. My love for God deepened, and I was proud to serve alongside a man I believed to be holy. But one day while in Manila, I received a long-distance call from him. He informed me that he had received a divine revelation intended for me and instructed me to travel to Cebu, where he would share this important message. He was also scheduled to preach in Cebu that Sunday. Upon arriving in Cebu City, we arranged for him to stay at the Park Place Hotel in Finti, Osmania. That evening, he instructed me to remain in the hotel while Neil Dalinda, the assigned worker, returned to the worker's house. When we were alone, I asked if I could just sleep on the sofa as it was a sweet room. Instead, he insisted that I would sleep beside him and Evan said in Bisaya, said in Bisaya, compatible yuta ging, kaya parehas mo color at ang suot. Translated, we are compatible because our outfits were of the same colors. I was wearing red pajamas with white dots while he was dressed in a red t-shirt and white pajama, white pants coincidentally. His words made me feel uneasy and quite nervous and I saw a different personality in him but I was quick to dismiss that unusual feeling. And because I had previously witnessed Ingrid Canada or ICC, Teresita Dandan, TTD, and Relina Salinas slept in his room alternately, it led me to believe that it was just normal and harmless. Moreover, we had been conditioned to suppress any negative thoughts about him. We are warned, we were warned that any suspicion on him 
would reflect our own personality using the words found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, I quote, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted, unquote. And in those days, absolute obedience was a must. We needed to have an unquestioned loyalty and rever reverence toward him. Sleeping beside a man I believed to be chosen by God was for me then a great privilege, an opportunity for a sinner like me. But what followed shattered my sense of faith and trust. Without a word, after turning off the light, he embraced me and dressed me and violated me with his last one act and left me in shock and speechless. He then said, this is the fulfillment of God's revelation. He explained that God had revealed to him that I was to partake in God's life through him by surrendering my body, soul, and spirit. He also mentioned that other girls would go through him in a similar manner. His words were strange, but I was too shocked to respond. The following day after the Sunday worship service, Apollo C. Kiboloy left for Manila, while I was left to carry on with my duties, including organizing carolers for our, for our annual fundraising. Confusion consumed me. I felt betrayed by my faith, by him, and even perhaps by myself. I began questioning whether what had happened was indeed God's will or simply a gross abuse of power. When I returned to Manila, I was once again instructed to sleep in his room. Fear gripped me, but defying the anointing of God was unthinkable. We had been taught that such disobedience would invite a curse. The next morning, he asked if I understood God's revelation. I remained silent, unable to process what had happened. He then referenced me to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 12, explaining that just as Jesus humbled himself and obeyed God, even to the point of death, so he too must obey God's will by partaking in carnal things. He claimed this was necessary for him to understand the human experience and to fully empathize with others. He even told me that he, that he had also been reluctant to accept God's revelation, but as God's chosen one, he had no choice but to act on it. I was more confused with his explanation, but I could not complain. I wanted to go out from the ministry, but I lacked courage. I did not know where to ask help. I had cut all the bridges behind my life, and I could hardly go back because it would mean starting all over again. My family was poor and I had no connections. My option was to stay because I was still bothered. With what? What if, it, what if? What if it was indeed God's will? December of the same year was an escape for me. Caroling is one of our sources of funds and which had been participated in by every member of the ministry all over the country became my excuse of staying away from the worker's house in Manila where he stayed. In January 1994, I was in his room with Ingrid Canada, the international coordinator of the church, Tessie Dandan, the national administrator for the church in the Philippines, and Felina Salinas, his personal assistant. During that- Ms. Teresita, before you continue po, yung nabanggit nyo ng dalawang beses, Ingrid Canada, nandito po ba siya sa harapan ninyo? Yes, patabi po siya ng ni Mr. Kipo. Sila po, yung nagtaas ng kamay. All right, salamat po. Please proceed, Mr. Resita. During that meeting, he informed the girls that I would be included in the inner circle. Right there and then, I realized that these women had likely endured similar experiences. Without any words, we shared a mutual understanding. None of us dared speak about what had happened to us. In February 1994, I was sent to Hong Kong, still carrying all the confusions and emotional turmoil. Despite this, I continued to pretend that everything was fine. When one of our musicians, Jesse Pangilinan, was scheduled to return to the Philippines, I seized the opportunity 
to send a personal letter to ACQ. In that letter, I poured out my feelings, openly expressing my emotional distress. I was honest about how deeply shocked I was to learn of his life beyond the pulpit. The man I had revered as a holy figure was in reality an ordinary mortal, one who had exploited my genuine commitment and dedication to God. My faith wavered and everything I had once believed was shattered. I prepared myself for a harsh response, expecting a violent reaction from him. To my surprise, there was none. Instead, I was sent back here. Upon my return, I was even more surprised to learn that I had been promoted. I was appointed National Crusade Coordinator, National Logistics Coordinator, and Luzon Area Administrator all at once. This was a sudden and significant promotion from my previous role. By God's grace, I excelled in all my assigned tasks. Despite this, fear gripped me every time Apollo Kiboloy would come to Manila. My only relief was when one of the girls would accompany him, giving me an excuse not to sleep with him. I kept myself busy, visiting satellite churches to distract my confusion and agony. One day, ICC confronted me saying, ACQ sensed my distance. I made my work an excuse. February 15, 1998, ACQ used me again. It was always out of fear that I obeyed, a fear mixed with anxiety that he might knew how I pretended to be extremely grateful that he allowed me to be a part of his physical life because in all, and, and in all honesty and God truly knew I was not. All the pent up emotions suffocated me that on the following day, while preparing for church, I collapsed. ACQ performed mouth to mouth resuscitation, but later I learned, he told others, that it was just a way for me to seduce him labeling me as Jezebel the Temptress. I believe Apollo Karyon Kibuloy understood that I never wanted the life he was trying to impose on me. My decision to dedicate my life to God's service was driven by a sincere desire for spiritual purification from the sins I had committed before becoming a full-time worker. I had only one goal, to live a holy life and ultimately to attain heaven. As the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, I quote, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust. But how could I achieve this with the circumstances that I was in? Disobedience and complaints were never an option. Anyone who did so was labeled as carnal, as someone who did not overcome the flesh. Everything was always twisted. One day, I said, Sir has noticed that you've been distant. I made up excuses trying to avoid the truth. I had been telling Tacy and Dan that I was extremely exhausted. She presumed that I was just too focused of my responsibilities, especially in the logistics department. I was always pressured to meet my 15 million quota. Every December on caroling season, if ever the sense that there was really something wrong with my belief, I was instructed to prepare my documents for you, my USA visa, and I believe realization came later when I already left from this group that it was also to distance me from the workers and members here that I might be able to tell his dark secret. I never wanted to go to America because inside of me were unresolved spiritual issues. Confused mind that bothered me always, always. But my visa was approved. I didn't know that I was to lead and plan for the fundraising to be done in America and we would employ the same strategy of our money making here in the country. In America, I witnessed the double standard life. What we prohibited in the Philippines, we did them there. We lived in luxury, we toured around, we dined in fine and expensive restaurants, we watched movies. Sky's the limit when they went shopping. 
I decided to stay in the apartment where the minister and his family lived. Despite the insistence of ICC to stay with them, I refused. I made a lot of excuses. Sapagkat, hindi ko po natin na kami nasa Amerika ay masyadong nagpakasasa sa paggasta sa pera na masyadong pinaghirapan ng mga kapatiran at ng mga full-time workers. Bilang namuno po sa crusades, evangelism at logistics departments, saksi po ako kung paano nagsakripisyo ang bawat isa para lang makapagbigay sa iba't ibang pangangailangan sa simbahan. Nakita ko na kahit pambili ng bigas ng membro, kailangan ng sakripisyo pa para lang may bigay sa simbahan kahit gugutumin pa ang mga pamilya. Nasaksipahan ko po na kahit last sintabo para pamasahi, kailangan ibigay pa rin, bahala ng maglakad, papuntang simbahan ang mga mahihirap na membro. Hindi kinaya ng aking konsensyang double standard life. Maraming workers ang napalo dahil sa panunood na ng sini, pero kami sa Amerika, halos linggo-linggo nanood ng sini, bawal sa amin ito dati. Naghirap ang maraming workers at members sa pagkaruling at pagsulisit sa bawat tao sa lahat ng dako dito sa ating bansa. May namatay, may naaksidente, may nakulong, may mga narate pa na hindi na nai-report. Dahil baka hindi pa niwalaan at baka makapagpasting pa dahil may kasalanan na itinago kaya napahintulutan nangyari. Lahat may kota, di ba? Napakasakit po sa damdamin ko dahil ako po ang namuno sa mga fundraisings. After December season, ang mga members kailangan magtinda na mga kakanin para may, may bigay sa mga pledges for Alay Kay Kristo, building funds, love offerings, television pledges, tithes and others. And when they could not provide for their own foods, they were just a sort of fasting. Meron din pa akong kota, 10 to 15 million pesos to raise in the month of December alone. I organized the carolers nationwide to meet my quota. We recruited and trafficked our young people from Mindanao and Visayas to carol in the provinces of Luzon and in the national capital region cities. Marami pong estudyante na November pa lang kailangan ng mag-absent sa paralan at ang iba hindi na nakabalik sa pag-aaral Dahil inuna ang simbahan, inuna ang pagkaruling, inuna ang paghanap ng pera. But nobody question where our income was spent. Sa mabuwa ng Pebrero hanggang October, ang ibang workers na nasa logistics department, kailangan magsulisit na naman throughout the country using the permits of the different associations. Pag-asa ng buhay, Children's Way Foundation, tulong sa may kapansanan, handog ng pagmamahal, pagdamay sa dukha, Shivers for Christ, the supposed income na dapat ibigay sa mga beneficiaries, sa mga nasabing associations, hindi naman talaga truthfully and honestly na ibigay. Only a little portion of the income was shared to the beneficiaries. Ang ibang workers naman, walang hinto sa pagtinda rin ng mga kakanin na may kota of 500 to 1,000 pesos a day, Monday to Saturday. Ito ang buhay ng mga workers na nasa logistics department. In America, they began to notice, notice my indifference. ICC called my attention, stating there were reports from my assistant in the logistics department in Manila that I had secretly sent money to my family. Then she informed me that ministers wrote letters to ACQ and reported that I tempted and fornicated with them during my visits to their satellite churches. I was so shocked to learn the sudden accusations. I also wrote a letter and enumerated the real circumstances of my life with all the ministers I came in contact with in relation to our aggressive fundraising being the National Logistics Coordinator. However, that was not enough. I was then forced to write a long letter of confession, making it appear that I was a sinner who committed all kinds of sins, including those I had committed before joining the ministry. I complied, believing that through this written confession, I would be totally forgiven from my old sins and burdens and be completely sanctified. In detail, I wrote everything I thought 
was considered sin I had committed from childhood until the present. I also implicated ACQ in my sins. It had the same tenor of the letter I wrote in Hong Kong in 1994. And this time, he was furious. Then ICC instructed me to revise my letter. I was told not to implicate ACQ and to state that I was the sole sinner and I was filthy. Upon realizing how angry ACQ was, I revised my letter out of fear and stated that I had sinned because I truly was filthy. In detail, I imagined sins. Ms. Teresita, yung paulit-ulit yung binabanggit na ICC, ICC, sino po yun? Ingrid. Chavez, Canada. Sila pa rin po. All right. Uh, please proceed. In detail, I imagined sins and I made it appear that I had committed them all. That was how stupid I was to obey and exaggerate my story. Just to appease the anger of our leader, Apollo C. Kibuloy, not knowing it would become my death sentence later. My exaggerated story was then distributed to all his leaders and ministers, and they believed I was filthy, I was pervert, and I was wicked, painting me as the sole guilty party, while ACQ remained, remained innocent. Little did I know this confession would lead to my condemnation within the ministry. And Mr. Resita, pag sinasabi niyo ACQ, sino po yun? Apulo Karyon, Kibuloy po. Okay. October 15, 1998. I was sent back here to receive a punishment through prayer and fasting in the guise of spiritual discipline. And the fasting they planned for me was beyond my imagination. It took me seven months to suffer hunger and isolation in the mountain of Tamayong in Kalinan, Davao City. They placed me in a small dark elevated room beside a kitchen, separated only by a mac and walls my bed was rough, made of uneven slabs, with exposed nails pressing into my back as I slept. I woke up this morning in pain, with no beatings, and the cold October nights left me shivering. I requested a blanket and a mat, but I was denied. Every day from 8 to 5 p.m., I followed a strict routine, regardless of the weather, enduring hunger and isolation. No one allowed near me, as I was labeled filthy and deserving of this punishment. Members were forbidden to speak to me. I was physically very weak and so depressed. depressed. I prayed that God would just take my life. Ilang beses po ako na nalangin na sana kunin na ako ng Panginoon. I started to question God and wondered, if this was truly a divine process or simply human punishment. I asked myself, is this ACQ's way of retaliating because I rejected the life he imposed on me? It felt like vengeance and disguised a spiritual discipline. My only solace came from reading the word of God from Genesis to Revelation over and over again. Every day was a struggle of faith. I struggled to believe that the process was still the perfect will of God for me. I struggled to believe that I really was a sinner and that I was recuperating from my spiritual disease with a lack of faith. That was to justify my present pains and at least, to at least lighten my burden of loneliness. On January 8, 1999, I gave ACQ a resignation letter and I requested for a fare so that I can travel back to my home in my province. He did not approve my resignation letter. I pleaded to Ingrid and like a child I cried for help but she remained untouched telling me that it was a divine process. After that conversation Miss redoubled. I had no money and I was still physically weak so there was no way for me to go out from the compound of the prayer mountain. Waiting for the restoration is the only alternative at the moment. 
if not for the comforting words of God, surely I would be totally gone out of my mind. They continually accused me of sins. They alone knew, unimagined, that would always lead me into fasting. It eventually hardened my heart because I started to realize that the purpose of doing it was to totally break me down and to even slowly kill me. <laughs> I no longer saw the reason to stay. I submitted my resignation as a full-time volunteer worker for the second time. But Apollo Karyon Kibuloy refused it again. A week later, on September 30, 1999, I decided to leave without asking for permission, determined to free myself from his control. It was only when I left of the group, out of the group that I fi finally clearly understood that the man I had believed to be God's chosen and holy was an impostor, oppressor, and deceiver. He manipulated me using his authority and power as God's anointed. I thank God that he took me out from his bandage, from that ambiguous feeling of fear mingled with so much love and loyalty to my Redeemer, Jesus Christ. But he was not finished with me and did not stop terrorizing me. Alex Kamia, his personal bodyguard, a full-time worker, once known to be a champion in gun shooting before he joined the group of ACQ, together with his team, kept coming to my place to harass me, serving a fake warrant of arrest to a minister who stayed in my house. This minister settled in my place after he was gunned down in Davao City but survived. The team of Alice Kamiya was apprehended and when investigated, they had several firearms in the car, several plate numbers, and there was also a red plate. The registered owner of the car was Apollo C. Kibuloy. Because of their failure to serve the warrant of arrest, they blamed me for hiding the minister and filed cases against me of obstructing justice and grave misconduct and an act on becoming a public official. After that incident, I heard that Alex Kamia was the suspect of the murder of an ex-worker who was shut down inside his home, and this ex-worker did not survive. I was scared to death when I heard this news. My option was to remain silent because killing could have actually happened when Kamia and his group came to my place. There was also an ex-worker, Elsa Bolivar, who was a senior citizen, a woman shot dead while she was in her garden, garden in Tagum City. I was so hysterical when pictures of her bullet-ridden body were sent to me because she had just visited me in my place before it happened. Fear consumed me and I remained silent. Three years ago, nagkausap po kami ni Alex Kamia. Humi po siya ng kapatawaran at nagsabi na siya ay nautusan lang po na kailangan din akong iligpit. Pinaniwala po siya na ako ay may malaking kasalanan at ako ay napakasamang babae. Nang tinanong ko kung ano ang aking kasalanan, sinabihan daw siya na tinukso ko raw si Apulo, Kayun Kibuloy. Nakiapid daw ako sa mga ministro. Narinig naman po ninyo yung sa video. Nakipagtalik daw ako mismo doon sa workers' house at nagnakaw daw ako ng 3 million pesos. He even said in Visaya, di ba nagtugot man ang ginoo pagpatay sa dautan? Doesn't God permit the killing of the wicked? Doon ko lang naintindihan na kailangang i-declare ni Apulo Kibuloy sa lahat ng mga workers at members na ako'y makasalanan at napakasamang babae para magiging makatwiran ang lahat ng parusa na binigay sa akin 
at magiging makatwilan din kung bakit ako kailangang patayin. Apollo Kibuloy called me Jezebel, the temptress. Using his pulpit to broadcast, to broadcast how filthy and evil I was, this became a pattern. Kung may mga workers na may alam sa kanyang buhay, sa sikritong, sikritong buhay, at aalis sa kanyang kingdom, sila ay akusahan na napakaraming kasalanan. He would always exaggerate their weaknesses. At ipaniwala sa mga workers at members na sila ay umalis dahil may mga marumi at mga, at mga napakasamang mga tao. His followers only heard his side of the story, which was always filled with lies and twisted truths. They are their side, our side, excuse me, was never heard and was never allowed to be heard. They only believed whatever he fed them and even defended him and attacked those who defied their leader without investigating the truthfulness of the circumstances. Nakita naman po siguro natin kung paano siniraan ng mga workers at defenders ni Apulo Kibuloy ang mga testigo dito. Mga napakasamang descriptions para lang ipahiya ang mga nagsalita ng kanilang mga karanasan sa loob ng kanilang kingdom. Mga salitang hindi nababagay sa mga tinatawag na mga citizen ng kingdom of Jesus Christ. Their intention is only to demoralize and warn others of the consequences of defiance. Last August 2021, during one of his television programs, he once again maligned me, broadcasting nationally and internationally that I was a fornicator and an immoral woman, which we have just watched. Madam Chair, I would like to remind Mr. Kibuloy to remember the biblical stories about the lives of King Nebuchadnezzar, King Sennacherib, and King Herod. All of them fell into the hands of the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar you know that, was separated from his people and lived like a beast and ate grass for seven years. King Sennacherib died a tragic death murdered by his own sons. King Herod was struck by the angel of God, died, and his body was eaten by worms. Their sin was that they replaced God with themselves, considering themselves as gods and blaspheming the one true God. This is all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Salamat po, uh, Ms. Teresita, sa testimony mo. kahit kailangan mong iyakan para uh, basahin sa amin. Uh, bago yung isa munang follow-up question ko sa inyo, gusto kong i-acknowledge yung presensya online ni Senator Cynthia Villar. Salamat, Senator Cynthia, sa pagdalo nyo. At ang uh, Minority Leader, Senator Coco Pimentel. Salamat ka ayos sa uh, pagdalo. Um, Kung walang uh, opening statement si Senator Coco at si Senator Cynthia, uh, bago yung uh, interjection ni Majority Leader uh, sa Department of Justice, isang mabilis na follow-up question sa ngayon, uh, Ms. Teresita o Ms. Ging, Ate Ging, just for the record, guilty ba kayo dun sa mga krimen na inakusa sa inyo? Yung pagnakaw ng 3 million pesos, yung pag-fornicate, sa iba pang mga ministro. Guilty ba kayo sa mga iyon? Of course not. All right. Salamat kayo. Uh, Majority Leader, uh, for your interjection with the Thank DOJ. You, Madam Chair. Uh, nothing to do with the previous testimony. Magpapaalam po kasi ako kasi magsasalita po ako sa Liga ng mga Barangay and I, uh, the Minority Leader is already here uh, to fill up some uh, legal questions likewise. But Madam Chair, before I leave, gusto ko lang tanongin ang Uh, hindi ko kasi nakita kanina, dito pala ang Department of Justice relative to my previous questions uh, uh, answered by the DFA. This is speculative, academic, and uh, purely legal if, whenever, wherever, uh, if a, an extradition 
uh, request is lodged before the DFA. There is under the, the PD, which I cited before, a process which would necessitate the Department of Justice to file a petition. But that is another court. And that is another court which would constitute as the extradition court here in the Philippines. And if there is going to be an extradition hearing, the purpose is not to determine the guilt or innocence of the accused, but whether they would fall under the ambit of our extradition treaty. Is that correct? Who will answer? Attorney Torrevillas or Attorney Quintana? Speculative lang ito. Ano lang to? Uh, Senior State Counsel Quintana, I believe, majority oh, leader. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, sir. Good, mo good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, as to the... Um, as, to, as to what will happen on... I mean... Uh, should the De Department of Foreign Affairs later on receive a request for the extradition of uh, Mr. Uh, Kiboloy and the uh, uh, present criminal cases are filed against him? Um, the, the Philippines, as a requested state under the Philippines uh, U.S. Extradition Treaty, has the option to um, postpone the filing of the extradition case, um, in which case... Um, postpone? Uh, only the filing, Your Honor. Uh huh. But uh, is the extradition court would be constituted here in the Philippines. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Not uh, necessarily the the court where the hearing is being conducted. Yes, it, it would be a separate um, separate proceeding, and as I mentioned, uh, it it might be postponed, or we can we can accept the request and file the case in a separate extradition case. It will not be a criminal court. No, Your Honor. Uh, as you correctly pointed out earlier, um, the extradition court is not there to determine the guilt or innocence of the uh, subject of the Thank request. you. Thank you, uh, Attorney. But my, my, my second question is related to the first question and to the previous questions. The extradition shall not be granted under Article 4 when the person sought to be, when the person sought has been tried, convicted, or acquitted. Tama po ba yan? So, may pag may pending case na rito at mabilis yung proseso, conviction or acquittal, hindi na siya pwedeng i-extradite. Is that correct? Um, Your Honor, um, under Article 4, uh, that may be a ground for refusal of the request for extradition. But uh, that in that case, uh, so Your, Your Honor, ang ano po dun, parang uh, uh, in effect parang double jeopardy but in this instance po um, there is no double jeopardy kasi po yung I'm saying double jeopardy uh, one of the grounds for refusal would be when there has been a trial conviction or acquittal that's explicitly stated under article 4 prior prosecution double do jeopardy, jeopardy will not apply because of the concept of dual sovereignty am I correct? yes your honor so, mas, ang, ang tanong ko, mas makakabuti ba na mas mabilis ang trial sa Pasig which would result in either conviction or acquittal dahil hindi na pwedeng ma-extradite? Ma um, sir, it, it, it's independent of the request for extradition. So, regardless if the, if the criminal cases uh, are terminated, uh, I mean, are uh, expedited, it will not affect the extradition request. Siguro, aralin niyo mabuti itong Section 1 ng Article 4. Parang very explicit naman ito. Uh, you still have time. Number three question. I learned that the, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure you're following this through news accounts, that the Department of Justice of the United States dismissed the charges against a certain Miss Duenas. Duenas? Uh, tama po ba yon? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Yes, and this was just a few weeks ago. Last week, Your Honor. Last week. October 7. So, ang tanong ko rito, and this will probably be uh, a lingering question, what would be the effect of the dismissal of the U.S. cases against, is, is uh, Duenas a miss or a, a male? Ano ba yan? He. He. Female? She? Female. Female. What would be the effect of the dismissal of the U.S. cases against Ms. Uh, Duena to the pending cases of uh, Pastor Kibuloy in the Philippines, since some of the elements would be the same? 
Uh, Your Honor, if I may defer to uh, Prosecutor Torrevillas. Torre, Torre Deputy State Prosecutor Torrevillas, please. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Senator Talentino. Uh, it will not affect the cases pending against Pastor Kibuloy, considering that uh, Ms. Duenas is not one of the accused in those cases. Oh, one, one of the accused in cases pending for the Regional Trial Court here in Pasig, or or in, in the United States uh, uh, Department of Justice, San, po, San Jurisdiction? Uh, before the Regional Trial Court of Pasig and Quezon City, Mr. Uh, Mr. Senator. So it won't affect? Yes. But the, the, there is uh, an, 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 a, an interrelationship between the elements involved in the U.S. cases uh, and the Philippine cases. Tama po ba yan? And probably I'm, I'm not, I'm I, not uh, I, jumping the gun on what uh, the defense counsels were doing. So, what effect? As, as I've said, this is just speculative. It will not affect uh, the cases pending before the Regional Trial Court of Quezon City and the Regional Trial Court of Pasig because uh, Ms. Duenas is not one of the accused, neither she one of the uh, witnesses for the prosecution. But uh, some of the defendants uh, in the case pending before the U.S. Department of Justice are likewise defendants here, are accused here in the Philippines. And I understand there would be a second hearing come May, come May 20 uh, before the U.S. Department of Justice. Tama po ba yan? Uh, I am not aware of that. Okay. So, paano naman kung yun ang magkaroon ng ibang desisyon while pending dito sa sa Pasig and Quezon City ibang kaso. Any speculative answer? O kung wala, mahirap po siguro. It has no connection at no all connection because at all. Opo. different jurisdictions, different Di elements. Again, Madam Chair, maraming salamat po sa pagbibigay sa akin ng pagkakataong uh, makapagsalita. I reiterate again uh, my earlier statements that respect and dignity should permeate the entire proceedings today. And I hope uh, that the dignity of the Senate through this committee will be enshrined, uh, Madam Chair. Maraming salamat po sa pagkakataong ito at maraming salamat sa mga resource persons natin na dumalo. Maganda umaga po sa inyo lahat. Dagang salamat. Maraming salamat din po, Majority Leader, and of course, the Chair and the whole committee ay nakikiisa dun sa patuloy na pagtaguyod ng respeto at dignidad ng Senado uh, at ng Senado para sa lahat ng uh, lumalok dito sa ating mga pagdinig. So, balikan po natin si Ms. Teresita at Tiging, mga patuloy po na uh, follow-up questions ko sa inyong uh, testimonya kanina. So, uh, batay po pa rin po dun sa testimony ang binasa nyo kanina. Anong taon nga po kayo sinimulang abusuhin uh, ayon sa inyong testimony at alaala? It was in October of 1993. October of 1993. So, 31, uh, 31 years ago po. Yes po. Alright. Uh, tapos ulitin ko lang po yung nabalitaan kong fasting o dry fast. So, hindi kayo pinakain, hindi kayo pinainom ng tubig. Uh, ilang araw nga po ba ginawa ito sa inyo? At wala po bang kasamahan ninyo doon na sinubukang tulungan kayo? Of course, nobody would ever dare help me because upon instruction na hindi nga ako ipak and they did not even allow, they were not even allowed to talk to me, not nor even to come near to me. So, actually there were two sets of fasting <clears throat> uh, given to me. One set was, there was straight 10 days fasting. There was no food, no water. Uh, it was Ninet Ukya who gave me the list of instruction. And number one in the list is to do dry fast for the for straight 10 days. <clears throat> Sino po nagbigay ng instruction? Ninet Okyas. Ninet Okyas. Yeah. Okay po. And then, I only was able to eat a little amount of rice and viand on the 39th day because when you had when you have fast you had fasted hindi naman kailangan kakain ka agad. so there was water then am then lugaw 
And then finally, on the 39th day, that was the time I was able to eat rice. And then after that, there was that second round of fasting, which was even more miserable. It started on February 6, 1999, and there were other workers also. And that's, that was very miserable because it was like this. We were given five days or sometimes seven days. It was a kind of a, a series of fasting. The first, second, third days were for dry fasting, meaning you cannot, you were not allowed to drink, of course, to eat food, dry foods. And on the fourth, uh, sometimes it's water, it's sometimes it's arm, sometimes it's lugao. Then another five days, the same pattern, sometimes it became seven. It ended on the May, May uh, it ended on the month of May because I have my diary on that. So yung pangalawang dry fasting, tatlong buwan, na may iba't ibang classing fasting for five days or seven days, one to three days na dry fasting, yes. on the fourth day may tubig o yung am, yung am yung pinakuloan ng sinaing, di ba? Yung and, pinapainom ng mga lolo't lola natin sa mga baby nung panahon ng and, World and War II. Yung sabaw ng ano po? Sabaw. Lugaw. sabaw. Ah, sabaw ng lugaw. Yes, or, or lugaw. So over three months, may ganitong series ng mga iba't ibang klase ng dry fasting. Yes po. But I was together with other workers also because they, they were also punished. But I was the longest. I stayed there for the longest uh, three, three months. And yung una pong dry fast, yung unang set ng dry, pagpapadry fast sa inyo na sampung araw, walang pagkain, walang, walang tubig. Sampung araw na walang tubig at sampung araw na walang pagkain? Yes po, that's true. Paano niyo po na-survive yun? I did not even think I would survive. Opo. Because of course, it, the, the place is cold, was cold. And then every time in the morning when I took a bath, so parang doon ko na lang na, na, nalalasap yung tubig. Kaya I keep taking a bath three times a day. Iniinom nyo na lang yung Halos, uh, tubig kasi pampaligo. Natatakot ka namang baka masira yung tiyan mo. Parang, parang ganun lang. Parang... And after 39 days, ganun ulit. Uh, pinainom muna kayo ng tubig, and ng am, and then pinakain ng lugaw, and finally, kanin. Yes, on the 39th day. But there was a month, uh, I think it was December, month of December, may kinain na rin ako doon. Kaya lang, Again, maybe they were not satisfied with the result. Maybe they wanted me to really slowly kill me. So again, I fasted for, I had another uh, series of fasting that was, as what I have said, it started on February 6th and ended on the month of May. During those two times po, yung dalawang set ng dry fasting, yung unang sampung araw at yung pangalawang umabot ng uh, tatlong buwan, uh, nakakulong kayo noon or were you restrained in any way? No, it, uh, I was just there in the mountain, in the prayer mountain. Not really uh, kulong, but the place is big naman. So I had to go to the prayer house. Uh, I had to pray, I think, three times uh, a day. Nine o'clock, twelve o'clock, four times a day. Four and then six o'clock in the evening. And kanina sabi nyo dun sa pangalawang set ng dry fasting sa inyo, over three months, may ibang workers pa kayong kasama, bagamat hindi sila kasing tagal na pina-dry fast tulad ninyo. Bukod dyan sa pagpapa-dry fast, uh, yung ganyang abuso sa inyo, meron ka bang na-witness na iba pang mga pang-aabuso sa iba pang workers? Yes po. Actually, there were workers who were placed in a, in a closed tent Mm -hmm. Parang Bartolina, ang, ang tawag namin doon, Bartolina. They were placed in a closed tent. There were even torches uh, placed around because during the evening, they would uh, put fire on the, church, uh, the torches. And then they pulled and peed inside the tent, closed tent. And then, of course, they suffered too much heat in, the, in daytime and the colds in the evening. But eventually, they managed to escape. Uh, one by one, but the only one who survived, she was rescued because she was dehydrated already. So the only one who survived, the yes. rescue? Yeah, it was Lani Alfaro. 
Dahil dehydrated si Miss Lani Alfar, ano po nangyari dun sa ibang nag-escape dun sa mga tents na yon? Actually, because there were ministers who were also used as their security guards, they were actually helped by the ministers to just escape. So may mga minister din naman na naawa sa kanila at Meron din tinulungan po. silang makatakas. Yes po. Okay. Tapos, uh, Ms. Teresita Atiging, tama po ba na subject kayo, naging subject kayo ng attempted assassination? Uh, ito po ba yung sinabing ginawa ng angel of death? Of course, I would really think that way because I was just a mere worker, a civilian, and then why would these people come to my place, bring those light, uh, firearms, they were there, and if it was only to serve the warrant of arrest for my, the, my co-ministers, why would bring, uh, why would they have a backup car? Then I was made to believe that it was really their intention to harass me and to terrorize me in my place. May, da may dala po silang warrant of arrest? Saan yes. galing po yung warrant uh, na yun? As I have stated, there was actually one minister who had a problem, no? Then he was gunned down in Davao City. Then I actually helped him uh, settle in my place. And then... Ito po yung nag-survive ng assassination attempt. Survived. Then he was served by that warrant of arrest. And then, because he was in my house, I helped him actually. Ah, so nung pumunta yung mga uh, may dalang firearms at may backup vehicle, yung sineserve nilang warrant ay para dun sa nag-survive sa assassination attempt na kinupkop nyo. Yes po, actually para sa kanya. But I was made to believe that ako rin, pwede rin nila akong patayin. Bakit? Because there was one time the, the, there was uh, the 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 because he was, the, that Alex Kamiya was with a policeman. Bakit kailangan nila kung parang i-scale sale nila yung opisina ko? Bakit parang tinitingnan nila kung nasaan ako doon? Kung ang, ang gusto lang talaga nila, if they really wanted the warrant of arrest to be served with that person, why came to my office? For what? So yung I, Alex Kamiya ay may kasamang polis o siya mismo ay polis o PNP? No, he was with uh, a policeman, with... an official policeman during that time. At saka meron din po siyang kasamang siyempre driver. At saka, because I only learned later that there were two vehicles actually, but during those times, isa lang ang alam ko. Nung nakausap ko yung backup driver, kasi he is with me now, doon ko lang nalaman na may backup driver, may backup vehicle pala sila. Ngayon, Ms. Teresita, uh, at tiging, Pioneering member po kayo yes. ng KOJC. Uh, alam nyo rin po ba yung business model uh, ng fundraising ninyo at paano ito nagsimula? Kasi nabanggit nyo naging head kayo ng logistics, kayo po nag-organize ng mga caroling, yung mga solicitation. Uh, paano po yun nagsimula at anong, uh, anong alam ninyo dun sa kabuang business model? Yes po, the, the, the caroling... Uh... Caroling really had become, or maybe has even until now become, one of the sources of funds in the ministry. In 1988, I was able to join here in Manila, and we were only caroling the cities, uh, within the cities of the NCR. But when I led, when I was given the opportunity to lead the fundraising, I made it nationwide. I actually organized the nationwide caroling, Madam Chair. Then what happened, I, uh, I had... Uh, every province, I had leaders uh, overseeing 70 to 100 uh, carolers, including uh, adults who would be cooking and washing their clothes. And in the NCR alone, we had, I think, 13 leaders overseeing 20 to 30 members also. Do a caroling from 8 o'clock in the morning to uh, sometimes 10 o'clock in the evening, going around the cities of Manila, just caroling all the people here in the <clears throat> Metro Manila. And then, because I had a quota of, I start, it started with 10 million until it became 
uh, 15 million. Of course, they also had a quota. I also gave them the quota to meet my total quota of 15 million. So, sa bawat probinsya, uh, nung ginawa nyo ng nationwide yung caroling, din na lang sa NCR, may isa kayong leader na bawat isa may 17 to 100 carolers. Uh, at dito naman sa NCR, kung saan kayo nagsimula, naging 13 leaders na may 20 to 30 members each. So, i i-multiply lang po natin. So, sila po yung pinapatawan nyo noon ng quota para mabuo yung 10 to 15 million pesos. A ano po ito? Per day? Per week? No, that's one month. Of, uh, per uh, month. Yep, yes. Per month. And uh, so, 14 hours a day sila. Pwedeng nag nagkakarol, nag-fundraise, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yes po. Ganun po, ganun po katagal. Alright. Uh, Dagan salamat, Ms. Teresita Atiging. Please stay on sa hearing natin dahil yung mga uh, kas kasama kong senador, mga kauban ko, including our minority leader, may have qu questions for you. Yes, right now, you have the floor, Senator okay. Foco. Uh, Ma'am Ging, no? so, dito lang ako nababahala sa sinabi mo na dry fasting, yes, two po. times ang, ang experiences mo. And sa experience mo, it was a form of punishment. Very much a form of punishment. But it was actually a disguise like a spiritual discipline on me. Okay, but, this, this, but it was presented still as a disciplinary measure. Yes, okay. But uh, have you seen dry fasting as a form of a ritual or not as a form of a punishment? Is it also practiced there? Actually, there were two meanings, no? Of course, when we were... Uh, we were instructed to do dry fasting. We would always consider it as our sanctification, as our uh, cleansing on us, because we will always we would always believe that we were, because we would, we were always made to believe that we were sinners, and we we do accept that we were sinners. So we had to go through fasting. In, in the two particular, sa mention mo kasi dalawa ang particular yes, cases. Hindi ko na matandaan yung mga months. Pero in your particular case, punishment. At first, I did not consider it as punishment. Now, what you consider, how was it presented to you? You have to undergo dry fasting as a punishment? A spiritual discipline on the first. Oh. Talaga, spiritual discipline. Kung ando yung discipline, punishment, di ba? Okay, yung yes. pangalawa, yes, po. Or, or yung pangalawa, was it what? A fun, punishment also, yung pangalawa? Mas lalong punishment on the second round. Maybe okay. because they saw me alive still and still kicking. Uh, it was not their intention to really see me alive. Okay. That's why I had my second series of fasting. But so uh, observation mo, tagal ka sa kingdom eh. Meron, uh, you, you also undergo fasting as a part of a ritual, not as a punishment. Tama? Tama? Yes, there are many times. As severe as dry fasting? No, the, mine was the, the, actually was the worst. Yun yung mga fasting na alam natin, yung babawasan yes, mo lang yung yes, quantity ng kakainin mo, siguro gano'n, ano? Yes, yun ba yung meaning ng, yun yung sa ritual. Yes, okay. ritual. Ngayon, sa karanasan mo, ikaw kasi, obviously, nag-survive ka nung dry fasting mo as punishment, eh. Sa, ka, sa personal knowledge mo, meron kayong kasama sa KOJC na nag-suffer ng masamang consequence as a result of dry fasting as a form of punishment? Wala naman akong Wala alam, alam because I left 1993 po. 1999 ah, you left po, 1993? Eh. Ah, when did 1999. you leave? 1999 pa po. Ah, 1999. Ah, sige po. Oh, pero sabi mo, founding member ka, so uh, pero wala kayong nakita pala. Okay, except so, sa... So far, wala. Kasi sana, i eh, Kung meron, ha, kung meron, i-encourage natin sila ngayon na magreklamo sila because uh, this, might be a, this might be a violation of the revised penal code. How is it enforced pala? How is it enforced? Sabi mo kasi, sa Prayer Mountain, you're free to roam around. Eh. Pwede kang gumalang. So, paano kung super gutom ka na? You, can you cheat? Uh, can you cheat on the dry fast, fasting punishment? Um, we were tempted to do that. But because we're so afraid, baka madagdagan pa yung araw pag malaman. Okay. Uh, meron kang kinikwento na hindi, although hindi ikaw yung involved, sabi mo lang na may, may close tent, may mga ganon. Tapos may mga ministro na sila na mismo nagpatakas dun sa mga pinapanish. You know? So, uh, so naawa na rin siguro sila na baka napaka-severe nung mga punishment. But that's, you did not experience that eh. kaya medyo ano yan did you did you actually witness it yes sir uh, 
Yes, sir. And then did the ministers actually tell you na pinatakas namin ito si... No, the, I was just told uh, after those incidents when they got connected okay. to me. So kasi ang lumalabas na issue dito, Madam Chair, is uh, if there is a religious group or an organized group na meron silang system of uh, punishment, baka yung mga yung mga severity naman ng mga punishment ba sa baka some of these punishments already cross the line ano na they may, they may amount to already violation of the revised penal code Sige. thank you thank you madam chair thank you also uh, minority leader um so mr resita uh, atiging uh, saliw uh, uh, again Salamat kaayo and please stay on for uh, the rest of our hearing lalo na kung may ibang mga issues na ma-raise na gusto rin naming itanong sa inyo. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to comment, share, like and subscribe to Kilapinas Bolita now. Until the next video.